Heals welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heals is the largest non-governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heals was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives and advocates from around the world to meet, network and forge new scientific collaborations. by uh, Professor Alexander Sefalian from University College London. And um, we would like to hand over Thank this you. HEALS Distinguished Research Award. Uh, Professor Sefalian is the second winner of this award. The previous winner was Professor Holly Brombach, uh, who when does a research on the Ames Dwarf model. And uh, so uh, Dr. Sefalian gets this uh, uh, reward for his work on regenerative medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thanks a lot. OK. Ready, Mr. Chairman? Are we ready to go? Yes. OK. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk here. And, and thank you for, very much for the present and nomination. Um, I'm, um, I used to work a lot for UCL for nearly 25 years. Now I set up a company which is called NanoReg Med Limited, and I'm trying to commercialize what I've done in university. So today, I mean, there was a lot of talk about extracellular matrix, genetic, and this is going to be completely different. So I'm going to talk about material, nanotechnology, cells, to make organ regulation, how to get it to clinic, and so on. And, and I'm just going to give an overview of the talk. And anybody is interested in more in detail, please let me know afterwards. You know, we could discuss or exchange paper and so on. So um, over the years, I've been trying to develop. Initially, I was working actually a lot in cardiovascular devices, you know, to see cardiovascular disease, then I work on liver transplant, taking the liver transplant from a lab model to human at Royal Free Hospital, and we do about 80 liver transplant per year, very successfully, and then I went to more nanotechnology, regenerative medicine, and the materials, so which I'm going to give a talk to. Because this is, I didn't know what this meeting is, so it's aging, and healthy aging, but uh, which is, um, you know, love it as I'm getting older and I could see there are lots of work going on, especially on genetics, you could stop aging and so on. But currently, we are aging and for treatment, when we're aging, so more likely people get cancer, more likely the organ failure and treatment for those are still very poor. I'll put this picture and extremely very poor. This is here, yeah. So just recently, and I'm involved with this patient. This patient is 71 years old, and he got malignant melanoma in his mouth. And his effect is a palate in the bone and, and or throat and stuff. So he's going through operation, and the, the operation, they're going, they're going to remove entire maximal, you know, entire his bone up here. And only thing they're replacing it with some prosthesis. And it's quite painful. And, um, and, the, and prognosis, such a patient is poor. The only treatment is surgery, they said, and possibly chemotherapy. And, uh, you know, and even that is not very nice. You know. And as a matter of fact, the, the cancer has gone through his bone. And this is malignant melanoma. Apparently, it's a much more aggressive cancer. So here it is, you know, that kind of patient is there, you know. Currently, still a lot of treatment, chemotherapy, nothing has replaced it, and it's quite aggressive and not very nice. 
surgery, you know, still, you know, case like this, not very nice. So there's not any more new treatment. Or, and as we get older, organ replacement become more and more. And the most, in surgery, most treatment, cardiovascular, for example, you know, aging cardiovascular, the bypass graft is about 25 years old. If patient, they don't have an autologous bypass graft, that means piece of vein or artery, not suitable. If they have to put prosthesis, prosthesis in the market, it's already available, PTAP or Dacron, is over 30 years old and doesn't work very well. For coronary artery, there's nothing there. And for low limb, if they put 100 prosthesis bypass graft, in five years, 75% blocked. And a lot of amputation. So that's, that's the problem. So we, you know, and they're not, there's a lot of work going on on regenerative medicine. There's a lot of work going on nanotechnology, you know, tissue engineering, but it's not moving to patient. You know, and that's what's the major problem. There's tons of research goes on, but not moving. And that's what I'm trying to discuss it. <coughs> oh, this is outside. For example, previously they said cost of cardiovascular. There is cardiovascular device here. For example, car coronary artery bypass graft is um, about, um, it, the mark is about $12, $12 billion per year. And the, what is available is not good enough. Or if you go like a stent, you know, most people, you know, over 40, 50, 60, they have a stent in their body, carny or leg. And what is available is not good. And, and lots of problem. And there's a big market and the big company benefiting it. Even if it doesn't work, they're selling it, you know, because they, you know, there's nothing else there. But it's not good, you know. And that's what people, you know, we have to work and, you know, uh, develop something new. And aging society, as you get older, you, get, you need those more. So in 1997, I think I had quite biggest grant, or at least in a very big grant in UK, a three million pound grant, with a collaboration with Professor Hamilton and Walker. And um, so we had a grant to develop a small diameter, about four millimeter diameter, um, tube, like an artery, to replace a lower limb. That means from below the uh, um, knee, replace that in a squat form. So, and at the time, I was working entirely on cells, so completely tissue engineering bypass graft. And I was naive, I so thought I could get really develop a tissue engineering just from the cell, a bypass graft, and replace artery. So we work a lot on animal cells, you know, rat tail, collagen, aorta, smooth muscle cell. So we develop a, a tube, you know, this is by reactor, and in the middle is the stainless steel. We inject all this cell and collagen and form around the contract. Is that? Thank you. Contract uh, uh, around this uh, stainless steel, then we remove it. This is? This it? Yeah. No, 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 that's it. It was this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, so this, in the end, we developed five centimeter, really nice artery. You know, with lots of things going through, so going on. We put in, in the aorta of pigs, working this blood flow. We did a lot of gene expression, endothelialization, all kind of things. Looks, works very well. And then we thought, okay, we got to apply to human. So we got a um, patient, which is, uh, we got a piece of vein from the leg, extracting smooth muscle cell, endothelial cell, collagen, and we're trying to develop a same artery. Generally, you need about 40, 50 centimeter, you know, from the human cell to replace that artery. And I work a lot on it. And it keep getting infection, the cell didn't work very well, and so on. So this wasn't, you know, what we did from rodent, from animal, wasn't translation to human. And, and you know, this is a, a three years later, 
we did that and we couldn't get it any artery made. And also, remember, in the experimental, we made like five centimeter. Here, we needed 40 centimeter. And we did about, I think, 30 patient uh, vein, but we couldn't get a single artery made, you know. And so this, maybe people remember this, or at about 25 years ago, 27 years ago, uh, Harvard Medical School, they put this in the as um, New York Times or something, they say, okay, they make ear, you know, for, you know, so what they made, actually, they were trying to make cartilage, you know, and they had these chondrocyte cells and scaffold, this, you know, scar to make ear. And ear is needed because one in 6,000 children, when they're born, they got macrocial, deformed ear. That's why they were interested. And still they're trying to make it, you know. So just trying to say is some of the completely from cell and what's called tissue engineering regenerative medicine uh, still is far away from uh, to make organ to put in human. And you see, you read a lot in the newspaper and media these days, they print it as well, but nothing really for humans. There's a lot of the just stay in rodent and animal. So hence we stop and uh, we were, so we saw maybe we make a synthetic scaffold, you know, to go to keep hold it, then we improve that. At the same time, nanotechnology is a buzzword, so I said maybe I worked on some nanoparticle. So nanotechnology is, here is like a carbon nanotube, and, and these are the carbon nanotube, and nanotechnology, personally, I think, uh, magnetic nanoparticle and possibly graphene-based nanoparticle could go to clinical very soon, next five years, for treatment of cancer. You know, so for example, if the carbon nanotube, if you shine light to it, shine light, something like that, is absorb the light and give it as a temperature. About 50 seconds, it goes from uh, 37 degree to about 50, you know, 60 degrees and so on. And the cancer cell, I think, die about 49 degrees. So as, soon, as long as you could get it to cancer cell, you could shine light to the magnetic nanoparticle, they are about two, three nanometer. If you get it to the tumor, put the patient in magnetic field, MRI, and bombard with you know, radio frequency, you know, and they get hot, they vibrate, get hot, and kill the cancer. Um, so very future, maybe a long way to go. We could have a, maybe a mini robot running around in our blood vessel and trying to cure everything, you know, that kind of, but that long way. But, you know, this stuff like this, you could combine it and one day become that. Uh, like a, this is the quantum dot fluorescence nanoparticle. They are about from two, three nanometer, and when they combine about 10 nanometer and so on. Fluorescence nanoparticle, if you, we bought a chicken leg and we inject it. You could see very light fluorescent, you could see. For a patient, if they have a cancer, they usually want to see if, not they have a cancer, if question or if they have a cancer, uh, the surgeon send them to, um, um, uh, sorry, surgeon take the uh, sentinel node, send it to pathology to see if a cancer there or not. To uh, localize the uh, sentinel node is quite complex. You have to inject radioisotope, technetium 99, or blue dye, to, you know, to localize it. But if you could inject this quantum dot, can you, this make lots of, if you inject this. And I'm gonna do this too, thank you. If you could inject something like quantum dot, and it goes into the um, lymphatic system, and it pull a sentinel node, then you could move it out, you know, just localize it there. And especially, if you have some antibody to it, you know, which attached to cancer, then you don't even have to move it. Then you could say there is, you know, patient got cancer or not. And it doesn't even have to go to hospital. It could be just local GP or something, you know, general practitioner. So we work on quantum dot. There are lots of different quantum dot. The different color, these different wavelengths, you know, and we coat it, we, we can attach antibody to it. For example, here this rat had a colorectal cancer injected and pulled over there. And they're about 10 nanometer quantum dot. Nanometer, very small, you know, 1,000 nanometers, one micrometer, and so on. And here we collaborate with NIH. Here, 
um, uh, the light, just normal light. Here's quantum dot, five different quantum dot if superimposed, and you could see quantum dot where they are. Carbon nanotube, I told you, if you shine light to it, you know, it become hot and kill the cancer. Carbon nanotube is used a lot. Aerospace, the car, you know, old part is all carbon nanotube, 50 times stronger than stainless steel. And you could, like, for example, when people go to have extra, you know, people, the um, staff, they have an extra, you could, you could wear carbon nanotube made of apron, and, and it doesn't pass the x-ray, and it's much lighter. You could make that. But carbon nanotube also can be used, apart from cancer, make on material, make it conductive. You know, nerve regeneration work. For example, here, if you have a carbon nanotube and quantum dot <coughs> conjugation, you could inject it, shine light, and cancer die. A lot of this in the experimental still. Uh, magnetic nanoparticle, we use that magnetic nanoparticle as a stem cell tracking. So you could, or maybe you know, some of you be interested in gene, so if you conjugate it with gene, and one could be for delivery of gene, and second could track where they gene from MRI scan, you know. And uh, so we actually use for stem cell tracking where, we, where the stem cell goes and so on, what happened to it. And also magnetic nanoparticles, if you want, for example, to look at the, my, you know, treat the myocardium ischemic and you inject a stem cell, you could actually inject it and put magnet here and it all go to a certain place. And that's people working on it. Silver nanoparticle, in the antibacterial, you could put it on the, uh, anything you develop, your silver or gold nanoparticle for growth factor or in other stuff. But our main expertise is, I said, you know, previously we developed a tube entire from cell. And we couldn't make an artery out of it because we made and didn't work very well. So here we make an artery from synthetic material. We synthesize nanocomposite man material. Nanocomposite, that means one particle in a nano size. So we synthesize something called pus uh, um, um, nanoparticle, is based on sil silicon base, and it's 1.5 nanometer, and then polycarbonate urea before we synthesize, and this is polymer we synthesize. Uh, sorry. And also, at the same time, we synthesize graphene nanocomposite for conductive material. And we, we started, my PhD student, uh, she did, she worked on this one. Now she's actually working for Google Innovation. And they're extremely interested in uh, conductive material for regenerative medicine. We did work a lot on insects because nanotopography is quite, you know, uh, it, I mean, nanotop all our bodies made on nanotopography surface. Insects have nanotopography, like butterfly, they can change color, like beetle on the surface is hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and this is quite interesting when you do regenerative medicine or like a work. In inside, if you make something inside the body, you don't want to get infection, sometimes you don't want nothing get attached to it, and sometimes you want cell to get attached to it. So this is a pattern we've been working on it. Um, Nanotopography, this atomic force microscope, this without nanotopography, this with nanotopography. If you, want, if you look in something like super hydrophobic, so this is super hydrophobic. So if you develop a material super hydrophobic, nothing gets attached to it. And that's very interesting in surgery because if you put it in the body, there's no infection. Or you could paint the hospital super hydrophobic material and there would not be an infection. In, in, the, in the other industry, like a car industry or something, if you, if you develop a super hydrophobic material coating, if you coat your car, you know, then it doesn't get dirty. Uh, when rain comes through, it just falls through. If you coat your um, window with super hydrophobic, you never have to clean it. So we got nothing get attached to it. So it's hydro, super hydrophobic interesting. We, we got, uh, I got in contact with Prof. Parker, Natural Science Museum, History Museum. He gave us some butterfly wing. At the time, we were interested to see what pattern the cell grows better. So we said, okay, we actually, we have a natural pattern. And as an interest, academic interest, we grow some cells on it. Also, it wasn't easy because 
Asteralization is easy, not easy, and gamma ray, all kind of thing. But we're trying to get some data out of it. And this is all different, and uh, on the SCM, different pattern butterfly wing have. And boom. So here we have a, uh, we, then our material, we pattern it to certain things, with natural and you know, non-natural. And we find out if you have a, a pattern on the material, synthetic material, cell pattern, cell grows much better without the pattern. So that's what we're trying to do. So when the, you want to make a regenerative medicine, when you put the organ in, sometimes you want to integrate into the, your tissue surrounding. So you want cell growth on there. Or when you put a stem cell onto it, you want to proliferate, you want to grow. So pattern is quite interesting, lots of different patterns, and different cell types like, like the different pattern. Like endothelial cells, like certain pattern, or chondrocyte, like different patterns. So that's quite interesting. Um, we used to use a lot of bone marrow stem cells to incorporate into our tissue, in our scaffold, to make organ. But now we use atable stem cell. The reason is because if you use uh, bone marrow stem cell or something, then you have to use go to culture lab and put it on it and do uh, culture. And that's quite expensive. And also, regulatory body is quite difficult. Anything you take out of the operating theater, you need lots of permission. So now, make it, we make some facial organ or something. So what we do is we take um, a stem cell from fat. So patient comes to operating theater, you get the fat. You know, just they come, and you give it to a technician or nurse or something. They extract the stem cell, not pure stem cell, adipose stem cell, also the combination of stem cell and, and endothelial sensor. And then we incorporate to our material for, to cause angiogenesis, to integrate around the tissue. And for example, if you have a nanoparticle or if you develop synthetic material, you want to be, see if they are one and not toxic. And second, if they integrate into tissue, and um, what we do, we, one of the first ones is quite easy to do. You just buy an egg, cut the egg, you make your organ here, you know, the scaffold, you put, we put adipose stem cell onto it, and then put it into egg, and you put it in the incubator. And just before it comes chick, at a certain time, you kill it, you, kill, you take it, you break it, and uh, then you look at it. Like here, it looks like a Photoshop, but actually this is a blood vessel growing into the scaffold. And no permission, nothing you don't need, you know. And, uh, and you know, not lost all this you know, regular tea, animal work permission. So that's quite nice work you could do. Or then you could go to the rat or something. You put your scaffold there. You want to see if it, tissue grows into it or not. You know, that's the kind of patient we deal with, you know. So uh, I used to work in the part of surgery at the Royal Free Hospital, which is part of University College London. And uh, when you work in the part of surgery, you know, as an academic scientist, people always, the uh, surgeon, they bring patients, oh, can you do something for that? You know, so they bring patients like this, and can you make a nose? And uh, so two weeks later, they come, they say, have you made it? You know, they, don't, they think it's just like a simple, you know, but it's quite complex, as you're aware. You know, so those kind of things, you know, we do 3D printers, so scaffold we make, print, 3D, and so that, Either we do 3D printer, their porosity, we get it right, because also cell, they like different size, you know, porosity to grow into it. Different cell, again, they like different porosity. Or we get salt, we add salt to the material, we make the scaffold, then we put in the water, salt comes out, and leave, leave with that size uh, holes into it. Salt, we use sodium bicarbonate, we buy it from Sigma, different size and you incorporate it into material. And what we do, we put the material in the water, become coagulated, and the salt come out. So this is the porosity we get. And then this is the mold, then uh, it, that one we end up there, we get. Um, as I said, you know, uh, this, you know, like our synthetic tail, we could do 3D printing the scaffold, we could put it there, test it. Um, but if you make a material you want to do inside the body, you have to do toxicology tests, you know. So when we make it, we make, we put in a ship three years, but compatibly, and that costs a lot of money. You need to 
take all piece of the organ out to look at all toxicology completely. And if you make an organ, you have to put in the animal model to test it again. We, to enhance the, we make a lot of cardiovascular, well, we make cardiovascular devices. That's a stand, heart valve, and bypass graft. And, and in it, before we did the developed artery for the leg, and we had to take piece of vein from patient, extract in the filler cell, seed it outside in the lab, and take it to patient, put in the patient. That wasn't uh, commercially viable. Hence, if you develop something, you have to be commercially viable. And second, it was quite difficult, costly, and quite long time. So now what we do, uh, we, um, inside the material, we conjugate antibody, CD133 and CD34. Inside the blood, flowing, circulating blood, there's endothelial progenous stem cell. And we want to attract that and catch it, and then from shear flow become endothelial cell. To do that, we, I mean, here is just RGD, but Usually we do antibody, and we use fume silicon nanoparticle to conjugate the uh, antibody to material surface. Here, if this is like a surface of a vascular graph, here we got our antibody, and this is it goes there from shear flow, become endothelialized. To look at it, if it does work or not endothelialized, we use quantum dot, I was talking about it earlier on, we conjugate it, for example, to EPC. We set up a flow circuit. This is our bypass graph we develop. And then we could see, yes, you know, like a light, initially the endothelial cell, and then uh, become, uh, um, uh, sorry, initially the uh, CD133 uh, progenitor stem cell, then become endothelial cell from f shear flow. Here, like this is, this was in the animal model for nine months, and then you could see completely become endothelialized. Um, so we make the, we make the uh, sort of extrusion machine. We put the polymer into it, and it, it extrudes one meter graft. So we say one diameter we want, whatever we want. To. So what it is, there's a rod. It comes out, it goes inside the water, and the polymer goes onto it and rotate as this comes out, you know. So internal uh, diameter rod is the internal diameter blood vessel. It comes out, and it, it makes graph like this. We make the same viscoelastic property as artery. So the wall is porous. We make a sim you know, similar viscoelastic property as artery. And then we done our preclinical trial. Here is the expenses part. I did the animal work for two years. It cost about 30,000 pounds on the sheep. When we want to go to human, you have to do it on the GLP, GMP, GLP. Good laboratory practice, good manufacturing practice. And that cost us to do the animal work for nine months. It cost us about 350,000 pounds. And that, of course, we have to get a ground from Wellcome Trust, you know, that kind of, you know, same work. You know. So as soon as you come to something towards clinically, it costs a lot of money. So that we did. And now we started, initially we're doing the vascular access, which we currently be doing, and then we go to clinical trial for coronary artery, depending to vascular access. And heart valve, aging, you know, society, some people older, they cannot go through a general anesthesia. And so the heart valve have to be a, go through transcatheter. So through the catheter, you put the heart valve through. Initially, actually, a professor came uh, um, from um, Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. He asked us such a make a heart valve. Then gradually we make, you know, for both age, you know. So this is a heart valve. And so you go through the catheter, heart valve go, and replace the damaged heart valve, you know, like a stent. To do that, I collaborate with the guy Tano Rusi from UCL, a very clever guy, in mechanical engineering. He used nitinol. Nitinol is a shape memory alloy. So a lot of glasses, I don't want to push it too much, is <laughs> made from nitinol. So you squash it, and as soon as you let it, it goes back to normal you know, size. So if you buy a nitinol wire, whatever shape you make it, you put it in the oven 500 degrees, half an hour, take it out, and whatever you do, jump to that shape. 
you know, so a lot of things nice to make in you know, the game and stuff like that. So he made this scaffold from the nitinol, and then we made the leaflet from our material. So our material got the antibody into it, become endothelialized. So we have two material. One, become endothelialized, and also surface very hydrophobic. If you don't do that, become nothing. You know, nothing get attached to it. So this is the commercially available biological valve. This is our valve. This is the valve. Uh, this is the way the shape it is. That's the leaflet. That's the delivery system we made. That it is. And this is actually going uh, in preclinical trial. Again, costing us something like 400,000 pounds. And in GLP in Paris, a place called MRR, M -M 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 -R facility, is a commercial facility. So we, oh, so we wait in uh, to see. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Anyway, you, can, you cannot see it. Uh, the leaflet cannot see the x-ray. And this is just uh, doing the ship model. And we keep it for nine months. And it's actually nearly, I think, nine months. And if its outcome is OK, then we move to clinical trial. Yeah, this is just beating in the animal. This is the valve here. And just show that. Then we take it out. We look at examine all that kind of stuff. And um, so we really had the, we, we, to make an you know, organ, we have a scaffold. That one of those the best to have a, a scaffold, which we know is working, and we know is not disappearing, and enhance the scaffold with an antibody, by molecules, growth factor, and cells. So we had our scaffold, hence, and some uh, uh, professor came to us and said, you know, he, they got a patient in Iceland, and he's from Eritrea. He was a you know, uh, physicist, a student, and he had a um, cancer before. They had a surgery, a, a, a trachea. He had a radiotherapy, but cancer come back, and can we make a trachea for him? And so we accepted, and we made a trachea based on that, which is the scaffold. And you know, we made a cartilage ring, same as cartilage ring. We seeded with the cell. We have lots of different cell work we done. This is the bar reactor. You could put the trachea into it. These are the compassionate cases. So compassionate case, along you, what you need to get uh, approval from regular body and from the hospital, and you do it without no test. Only thing you do not have, you don't have to do tests. As long as they're satisfied, is not toxic, is good enough, they'll allow you. Because they, and there's no other option for patient. Usually they die if you, that, that the case, you know. And so we did that, so we didn't have to do the animal work for trachea and stuff, and, uh, and, pay, and uh, transplant in the patient. And the patient um, lived for two years and eight months, you know. And then he died, and uh, so we were happy, you know, it's not, it, nothing to do with trachea it, in terms of immunology or anything else. And also, because there wasn't enough time, they seated, the, the, um, the, um, the scaffold was seated with um, um, bone marrow stem cell from outside it into the wall, but inside it, surgeon took nasal tissue and suture it, cut it and suture it inside, become endothelialized, you know, so because it was so short time. And, but um, then, um, yeah, this is patient went to, went to Iceland and lived sort of happily for two and years and eight months. Uh, but then he died, and there were quite few problems why he died, you know, was his esophagus or his lung had, you know, half blocked or something, uh, still is going on. Um, yeah, we could make things, I'll show you. And I had a PhD student in this corner, she's hiding. And Carla Shalukat, she uh, was from Switzerland, she's an eye surgeon, and she came to me, she said she wanted to make tear dog. And I didn't know even tear dog, what problem there was. So there's a tear dog here, 
and people get cancer and they remove it and special older generation and you know get blocked and stuff you know and if you don't have that tear dog the tear just run on your soul, you know on your face and quite tedious so currently they use Jones tube and this is the teeth about four centimeters you could see internal diameter is like 1.5 millimeter and when they uh, put it here and drain it into nose it, it breaks it comes out and that's why they roughen it, the surface and not come out, you know, that, and it still is big. So she made this, and she could see black color because is, um, is she add um, silver nanoparticle to, as an antibacterial, you know. And she put a uh, few patient, and you could see our first patient, that was 2010, it drained into the nose. And, and the inside diameter was eight micrometer. Uh, and that's quite challenging to keep it open to the outside world, you know, not internal outside. Yes, you know, we got all this facility, and we we done some first in man, but now still this is a compassionate case, first in man, but it need to be commercialized to to become a product for people, you know, otherwise just stay there and nothing, just piece of research. So that's why we set up the company and trying to commercialize it. And if you commercialize, you have to do all the approval, you need your research done, then you need approval, funding, industry, commercialization. When we come that, oh, it's really a problem. And we have problem, you know, overall in, in thing, the lots of research goes on in, in, in university, in company, I mean mainly university, lots and lots of research goes on. I spend lots of money not getting to patient. Every day I get this email from people, can you make this, can you make that, can you make sing, you know, finger, can you make liver for us, can you make, all over the world. And now people also with the internet, they keep reading about it. And the media come and hyping out this thing, you know, yes we can cure this, that. And people want it. And they're not happy, just, you know, in the old days, academic research is staying in academic research. Now it's in the media. So everybody, you know, say, yes, if it's cured there for this, why can't I have it? You keep saying it's not for you, it's not for mice and rats, but they're not happy with it, you know. And so here, uh, too much red tape. If, you know, to get anything to clinical trials, so difficult. So most academics, they're not bothered, you know, because that's not their job. They do the academic, they stop there. They got their paper published, they're not pushed forward. And that's the problem. And hence, you know, very few research moved to, from, from rodent work, really, to patient, you know. And that's what public, they don't understand. A lot of work, they say, well, Q for cancer found out, you know, like so and so, you know, immunotherapy. But it's just done on the, some rats, not on a human. And maybe another 10 years to go on human. GMP, GLP, good manufacturing practice, good laboratory, anything you do in lab to do exactly on the GMP costs, you know, at least 50 times more. You know, and it's all paperwork, but it then in the end, in that was required. And then also time, a lot of time, and not, not many GMP facilities. For example, if I want to do GMP facilities, self facility in London or um, a scaffold, maybe one or two facilities are extremely expensive. Hence, when you, also when you apply article approval, MHRA, the last of this form you to fill in and very specialized, you need to get people to fill it in and that costs money. And if you don't do it, then you get rejected or approval, depending on how much money you have. Just simple, the sterilization technique. If you develop something to sterilize it, you in the lab, you sterilize it. As soon as you come to sterilize it clinically, it's quite, have to be on the GLP. You have to send it to the company, sterilize it, come back on the GLP. They have to certify. Not every company does that. To do that itself costs about 200,000 pounds. You know, to identify why, you know, to do that. So that, that's the problem. Um, a few years ago, um, the um, Welcome Trust and Channel 4 in the UK, they asked us to uh, make a bionic man. So to ask all over the world what organ they made, we put them together and become a bionic man. 
So we ask all over the world, anybody have an organ, please send us, we stick it to this man to get it. But in the end, there wasn't many organs you know, there. If you look at it, there is a heart, uh, heart pump comes here somewhere, yeah, heart pump. It's made from American company, you know, and this is even that, it's not implantable. You could implant it and there's a machine there, yeah, and but it lasts about maybe maximum six months to a year. And then we stick our trachea, we stick our blood vessel. The Sheffield University, they make some artificial blood. We put that through artificial blood. And there's a, this is, was working very well. There's a company in London, they make a bionic arm and hand, you know. And, and this our presenter, he actually from childhood, he you know, had problem with arm and hand, so that's what he had. And he's the presenter, so, um, so we, those are working very well, arm and hand. We had pancreas from Leicester University, from um, San Diego University, we had the um, kidney, but that was more like kidney dialysis, like a kidney cell. So we put them all together and, 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 and the face of that, we make a face for him. And this actually was working you know, robotically, <laughs> you know, going shopping you know, in Harrods and even having CT scan. And quite popular because for media, you know, to say for public to say what. Well, so it was it was about in six months in science museum, then to gone to Washington D.C. to Masonic University Museum. You know, like traveling. <laughs> yes, I mean that's a question initially that, but need lots of funding, help with large industry. You need large industry to take it to commercialization and because you need lots of money. And large industry, if we got, there's a cent and they're selling it and they're happy selling it and there's no competition, they're not very interested to have anything new. You know, it will cost them a lot of money you know, to come you know, So those are the problem. You know. One day if they see the competition, of course they move on. And even then, they buy your pay, patent and they shelf it. You know, they're not you know, using it. So that's one problem. And you know, really, regulatory bodies need to help the scientists, engineers, to, see, to commercialize that, to help them to push it forward. Not just say no, no, no. You know, that it should be one side, you know, all together. Uh, my PhD at UCL, and I set up. A, I said because I need money, I set up a um, company with this lady, Hannah Talutsulia. And uh, she's from Goldman Sachs, you know, she was from Goldman Sachs, so hence helped with our finance. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, could you comment on uh, Paul McCarrion's uh, um, experiments with surgeries and some problems with uh, some of the patients. Yeah. <clears throat> well, really, I don't want to, I'll just make a very short comment because um, it's more political than scientific, you know. Uh, but um, Paolo McCrini is a um, surgeon and uh, he moved to Karolinski Institute and he started, he did one trachea transplant in Barcelona using um, the cellular trachea, you know. So when you use the cellular trachea, you can put short uh, size, you know, if you put short part of the, I think the Spanish lady, they transplanted was up with something like one and a half centimeter, so that. So that's okay, but as, long as, as soon as you're going to have a long trachea, it claps. So you have to put a stent, and they use biodegradable stent, if they use and non biodegradable stent, then uh, the stent tend to make hole comes out. They use biodegradable, and biodegradable stent usually after it's eight weeks disappear, <laughs> then it cla you know, does clap. So he started using synthetic material, you know, to, as a scaffold, you know. And the first patient actually he did uh, was our trachea. So the Icelandic patient couldn't come to London, he went to Iceland, he made the trachea, he transplanted, the, you know. And we saw it was success and stuff. So, and then I don't want to say how, what, and he moved to another company, they make different material. Some of them were, I think, not as good as you know, and us and so on. But 
I think there's a lot of uh, things on the, I think it's, you know, what surgeons, scientists have to be quite open what they do, but a lot of problem is, is uh, problem of ethical approval, has it had ethical approval, not had it, and that's the main thing, and it's not just with the uh, Paloma Clinic, entire hospital. And as in a more detail, it just you need to read this literature because there's quite lengthy things, you know, and uh, so I don't want to mention you know, against any or against or pro anybody. Uh, maybe this is a very general question, but uh, what uh, what time frame do you think we are talking about uh, when it comes to growing the organ and? Uh, uh, from scratch, essentially, and the implementing them. Okay. Um, so, if you want to develop an organ, if you want, for example, to make an ear, and be cartilage, personally, I think another 20 years. If you want to make an ear, synthetic material, but enhance it, you know, become integrated in tissue and you put it under the skin and works well, Hopefully, we're going to clinical trial in two and a half years. You know, so you know you have teeth implant; it works well, and you know, it doesn't. You don't even you don't you know realize it's like you know it's um, not your own teeth. You know, hence look. But if you um, if you make a synthetic material, printed or make it the shape of ear, you know that kind of thing. So what they do. And if you incorporate whatever growth factor, you know, extracellular matrix, um, stem cell to enhance the inter but here, uh, currently, they, they, there's a company make a synthetic material. When they put this, come, extrude comes out. So the mechanical property of the synthetic material have to be same as ear, uh, the skin and the ear, not to come out. And at the same time, you want on the skin, there's a microvascular that you want to grow into the scaffold. So if you have such a material and you have technique, you can do that, then it's, it's exactly the same as here. And this is like a cosmetic more or less, you know. And but some organ like a, um, you know, a stent you're making, and again, I hope it goes sooner than three years. But it ex a, a capture endothelial inside the blood. So more non-biological when going to, into the patient. Uh, I was uh, very interested in uh, the last part. Uh, I am a basic scientist, so sorry for uh, maybe it uh, will not be so commercial. <coughs> but um, um, there are some uh, uh, reports in the literature suggesting that uh, when cells are uh, cultivated into not in uh, flat plastic, yeah. but in a three-dimensional sure. different type yeah. of uh, substrate, uh, they change uh, a lot the uh, phenotype. Sure. So it could be, uh, some people have suggested that uh, uh, some defects mm -hmm. that uh, cells do have, but they do not appear when uh, you, you, you put the cells in a normal plastic, uh, uh, they could emerge if you uh, play with different uh, uh, supports. Uh, and this could help a lot in, uh, for example, for uh, uh, early diagnosis of diseases, just picking up a few cells, put in the right uh, three-dimensional uh, structure, and check if the, how, if and how, the uh, phenotype uh, change. What do you think about? Okay, you're saying if, um, if you have a material and you put cells on it, you know, inside the body, it may affect the cell, you know, phenotype and so on. Is that, that what you're asking? No, no. Uh, the, for example, there are people who have uh, a, some, some diseases start, yeah. uh, say, uh, 10 or 20 years before the clinical okay. onset, okay? okay? Okay. So, in order to let emerge this uh, cellular defect, yeah. you do not see that if you cultivate the cells uh, 
in a normal way. Sure. But what do you think? Could it be possible to let emerge uh, hidden defects because the cells uh, okay. are stimulated in another way? So okay. the 3D so. is a sort of mechanical, but uh, becomes a chem chemical signal. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes, I agree with you. Sorry. Sorry. No. No. That's it. So that's what I was just saying. And uh, if you looking at the looking at the tissue engineering or regenerative medicine in vitro and then implant in vivo, 20 years time. Because a lot of work needed yeah. before such so organ... 20 years is too much for me. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> yeah, so hence, a lot of work needed to be gene expression, all this kind of yeah. work needed before going in there. That's why actually we, or I... For well, diagnostic, like, not for uh, therapeutic purposes. Well, yeah, even for that, like, it, it, it takes time, you know, to investigate all that kind of stuff. So that actually, I was working too long, lots of cell work, and moved to a scaffold using synthetic material because I wanted to move faster into the patient. But as you say, the material we developed as a scaffold, and only thing we add on, the addable stem inside the operating theater at the time. So, we, you know, it's completely different. What you're saying, yes, it, it is, you know, it's quite complex. Uh, it it complex. Yeah, yeah. But then, you know, then you say that. But, you know, the one have to, I mean, you know, if I say, you know, some people may say no or so, have to move to patient, have to see what's happened, you know. And, you know, chemotherapy if come today, it never could get to clinical trial. But it went to there at, you know, 50 years, 60, and now it's a product. And just, not just, just to make an example, yeah. we know yeah. that in our body, yeah. there are senescent cells. Yeah. But the phenotype of senescent yeah. cells, they are few, yeah. fully senescent. Sure. But there are a lot of pre-senescent cells yeah. that you cannot quantify. Yeah. So, Maybe using some of your tricks, huh? yeah. it could be interesting to let, you know? Yeah, so yeah, you yeah, could, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, I think we probably should round off. Uh, if David wants to ask a very short question. So you mentioned the drawbacks in the, with the regulatory process. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Some of the best practices were time consuming and expensive. Are you finding any sympathy from uh, regulators or from yeah. governments who work, want to work with you to find uh, more streamlined and uh, more effective processes for your requirements? I think you know, if the, every country like in UK, MHRA, they need to work with us. They say, okay, you know, if you do this one, we push it through quicker, or we have that. Not just, because also remember, it's a lot of work we do, a lot of member of regulatory body, they're not sure. So because they're not sure, you know, nanotechnology, nanoparticles moving close to the uh, patient, towards patient, you know, but they're not sure what, you know, they don't maybe have, they don't have the enough knowledge or they don't have enough expertise. And instead of saying, well, we don't have it, they just stop in it, you know. So yes, I, I expect like, you know, regulatory body, it, it can't be with you. Because, you know, if you, they say, you know, if we give you like, you know, I don't know, a five million pound grant, now, we want to take it to clinical, you know, because that money, you know, come from taxpayer, so on. Let, let's take it forward. So yes, to be working with you rather than, you know, you know, putting the hand up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.